Father, thank you for your word, which is your word to us. And we thank you for it is the living word of God. And Lord, you have you receive all of the credit for our salvation. Um, every bit of it belongs to you. And we we just want to acknowledge that. We we thank you so much. And we ask tonight, Lord, that you would teach us and feed us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated, please. And uh, let's open to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Um, we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30 in just a minute. But I'd like to kind of back up a little bit and give ourselves what is called some context. It's easy to forget what Jesus is doing and why he was doing it and who he was speaking to. But if you go to verse 1 of chapter 5, please, it says, One day, Matthew 5, 1, one day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. He did that because that would have provided him an elevated physical position to be able to speak to the people as they were down below him rather than he being on a flat plane with them. So he was trying to accommodate this large crowd so that all of them would be able to see him and hear him. It says, and he sat down, which was uh, typical of what uh, rabbis did. And then it says, his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. So though there is this large crowd, Jesus was actually teaching his disciples, those who were following him, and a disciple means someone who's learning, wants to learn, is devoting themselves to learn what their teacher has to say in hopes of becoming like their teacher. So the crowds were just having the benefit of hearing them, of hearing him, but he was actually teaching his disciples. And so then if we go over to verse 27, uh, I've entitled this message, Radical purity, radical purity. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, and then please notice, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So Jesus was revealing to the disciples, teaching them, the crowds were gathering, and what he's teaching them through this section are the true requirements of the law. For example, he says in verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, which would mean that, um, they as contemporaries with Christ understood, you have heard that it was said to the, they understood that their fathers and their grandfathers had heard this. And he's quoting from the Ten Commandments. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, and he begins to clarify the true requirements of the law. And as we know, Jesus was equipping his disciples through the word of God 
they were the ones who were going to be sent out upon his ascension to heaven. And so he's teaching them uh, what they needed to know in order to be of help to other people who don't know the truths of God. And so the true requirements of the law, and as we've looked at a number of times in Matthew ch chapter 5, verse 48, the requirement of the law is this. You must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect if you're going to enter into heaven. Now that on its on its own, if you just lifted that verse out of the whole Bible, uh, would that be an encouragement to you? Huh? But who said it? Who said it? So was he telling the truth? But generally speaking, we just kind of gloss over that because how do I, you know, we just kind of go, well, that's kind of weird, <laughs> right? Any weirdos out there? Okay. There's one up here. But um, what Jesus has, has been showing them in the previous example um, about anger is that the law calls for inner purity, not merely external obedience to the law. Thou shalt not murder is one of the Ten Commandments. Probably the majority of the disciples, as well as the crowd, would have said, great, I've never murdered anybody. But then he went on to say, but... If you've uh, called somebody a fool and you've been angry with them without reason, you've committed murder in your heart. And so all of this was to bring his disciples and ultimately the crowds to the point of having no confidence in their ability to meet God's standards and that there was nothing they could do to change their situation. Let me just put this in another question to you. Place yourself in your mind as an unbeliever. Is there anything you can do to save yourself? Hmm? God alone is the savior, is that right? But what do most people think they can do? Good works. So Jesus was setting the bar so high that even the, the, the best worker, is, he's going to admit, well, I'm not perfect like God. And so Jesus is beginning to show them the requirement is perfection. It's not just external perfection, but it's internal uh, purity as well. And so he wanted them to realize that there was nothing they could do to change their situation and they needed to realize that is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who took our place as far as being obedient to the law. In him was no sin, right? This is important doctrine for us to uh, remember. I'm sure most of us have heard the, you know, oh, you've committed adultery in your heart. I'm sure you've heard it. But who's really pondered the fact that Jesus mentions it'd be better to pluck your eye out and go through life with missing one eye than go to hell because you're an adulterer. Nobody really ever talks about that, but Jesus was talking about that, and I'm going to make an application to our broader society here in just a few moments. So you have to be perfect. Well, was Jesus perfect? He was, wasn't he? Did he ever sin? He didn't sin at all. Not only did he obey the law, but what else did he do on the cross? He paid for our sins, didn't he? And then the Lord raised him from the dead and brought him up to heaven so that we could be justified. And whoever will put their faith in Christ, you have put on, imputed to your account two things. Number one, his righteousness is imputed to you and also the fact that he paid for your sins. So Christ indeed is our savior because of his obedience and also he paid for our sins. So I've kind of broken this message up tonight in three ways. Number one, and this will just take a minute, the traditional standard of purity. Secondly, the radical new standard of purity and then the radical demands of the new standard of purity. So let's jump right in and begin again with verse 27. 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. So Jesus is reiterating the uh, this traditional standard of sexual purity. And what Jesus said here is word for word with the seventh of the Ten Commandments. The only thing he isn't mentioning, like, let me back up, what he said is, is perfectly good and it's a very moving statement of God's perfect law. The only thing that he, here is he, it, it is only mentioning the outward acts of adultery, but in the 10th commandment, it does introduce the internal aspect. I'll, I'll just read this to you. In Exodus 20, 17, but you shall not covet your neighbor's house. That's talking about inward attitudes. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything else that is your neighbor. neighbor's. However, for all practical purposes, the scribes and the priests and Moses did not emphasize the internal aspect. They emphasized, emphasized the external aspect. Uh, aspect and thus in Jesus's day the average Jew understood adultery to be you don't touch a woman and but Jesus is going to say well let me tell you about what the law really requires and so the definition that they were working off of was a conveniently narrow definition of sexual sin don't physically get involved with adultery. You either, by their standards, you either were or you were not an adulterer. You were not if you've never physically committed adultery. If you have physically committed adultery, you're in a, you are an adulterer. So it is a, a narrow, uh, it's a narrow definition. How convenient and how deadly, and let me explain. It is very natural for those of us who are non-believers, who are uh, non-believers, uh, excuse me, who are believers, to feel even the non-believers to feel smug and conceited. Well, I haven't committed that sin. Think as think as Jesus is talking now to his disciples and to uh, the crowds that had gathered there. It would have been very easy for anyone in the crowd, a non-believer, to say. Uh, you know, I've never committed adultery, and I'm certain many of them haven't. Jesus is speaking to the rest of you sinners around here. Not me. Why don't you reprobates listen up to him? But of course, Jesus knows our hearts, and he isn't buying it. Instead, he communicates a radically new standard of sexual purity. It is in continuity with the Old Testament but his standard overtakes the Old Testament standard and actually fulfills it. So that is the traditional standard of purity. If you haven't done it, you haven't done it. End of story. If you have done it, you've done it, and they're going to put you to death. You'd suffer uh, execution at their hands. So number two, let's look then at the radical new standard of purity. Verse 28, but I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, in understanding what Jesus means here, it's important to understand what he does not mean. Jesus does not mean looking at a woman in an admiring way is not sinful. If you see a beautiful woman, you can't, and you, you, you know, you can't walk around, you know, looking at the ground or looking at the sky. But if a beautiful woman walks by, what does a man think? He thinks, well, there's a very beautiful woman. Am I correct? So he isn't saying that you, you know, you can't, oh, I thought she was so beautiful. Oh, you know, I'm committing adultery. He isn't saying that. What he is saying is when you lustfully look at her, you, she catches your eyes, she's beautiful, and then you begin to lust after her in your heart. So Christ is not forbidding the natural attraction. None of us men would have ever pursued a date with the woman we married. Are you with me? 
I didn't really build that up. If you're not with me, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I can. But what he does forbid is what is called the deep-seated lust that consumes the inner person. Do you remember that statistic a few Sundays ago that in one year there were 33 billion hits on one pornographic website alone? 33 billion. And there are millions upon millions of websites. People are consumed. In fact, Peter said in his second epistle, chapter 2, verse 14, describing uh, this being consumed, he said, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, trying to get some young girl on the internet, that kind of thing. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. So it's the, the, the sinful part of it, you could put it this way, the look is not casual, but it's persistent. The, desi the desire is not involuntary or momentarily, but the intention and the consistent cherished looking is. Um, pretty clear, isn't it? Hmm? So it's not the first glance, right? It's the second look, right? And what happens is that swells with lust as that man or woman is looking at that person. So what Jesus is saying in no uncertain terms, that, that person has already committed adultery with that woman in his heart. That's what God's standard says. It takes place in the heart, in the very essence of a person's being. And Jesus categorically states that the lustful desire to have another man's wife incriminates one's very person. Mental infidelity leaves one completely guilty. Mental infidelity leaves one completely guilty. So this teaching by Jesus reveals four things. Number one, the exceeding ignorance of the natural man in spiritual matters. We put it to you this way. There are multitudes of professing Christians, and it is to be feared who know no more of the true intent of God's commandments than the Jews during the time Christ was on earth. In other words, the ignorance that was in the minds of the people Jesus was speaking to, today there are many professing Christians who have no greater knowledge than those people had. They're very ignorant about this. They know the letter of the uh, law well enough, like the rich young ruler who said, oh, I've kept all these things, but they never dream that they're breaking the sixth and seventh commandments simply because they've never committed the outward act. And if you were to ask a professing Christian today, um, have you ever committed adultery? Unfortunately, many might say, yeah, I have. You know, I, I actually was with a, a lady or a man was a woman was with a guy. But for those who have not ever actually done that, They'd say, no, I've never committed adultery. But what has Jesus just said? Hmm? Hello? Mental infidelity. It's, it's sinful. So a lot of professing Christians and unbelievers, of course, are going about very content, but oh, how happy are those who understand the full intention of, intention of the law of God. So that's number one. This teaching teaches us the exceeding ignorance of the natural man in spiritual matters. Is that getting across to you? Most people wouldn't say, well, I've never committed adultery. They're, they're sincere. Well, the fact is they have. This teaching also teaches us the exceeding holiness of God. You know, listen to this, holiness. Our Father which art in heaven, what's the next part? 
And what that means is holy are you. Our Father, holy are you. You are different than we are. God is light, 1 John chapter 1, and in him is no darkness at all. So by going through here, Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, these verses are teaching us the very holiness of God. Our God is most perfect and most pure but he sees faults, he sees our imperfections, where man's eyes see none. He reads our inward motives. He notes our words and thoughts as well as our actions. Do you remember where Jesus said, um, uh, speaking of unbelievers who were going to be standing before the great white throne judgment, he said, you'll have to give an account for every idle word. Do you remember that? And every idle deed. So, you know, we could be with people who are, you know, the nicest people in the community, the wealthiest people, the most honored people, but if they're doing these things, God sees it in their heart. Uh, man can't see the heart. God, God doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on what? The outward. God looks on the inward part. The third thing it teaches us is it shows us the exceeding need we have for the atoning blood of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. What man or what woman on earth can ever stand before a holy God and plead not guilty to lustfully looking at someone? Do hmm? you think there's anybody who could plead not guilty? Come on now. Y'all can talk. Y'all can talk. And the reason why people feel the way they do, that they're okay, is simply, and I hope this is getting across, they do not see the strictness and the holiness of God's Ten Commandments. If they did, they would never be able to rest until they were safely in Christ. And fourthly, this teaching here teaches us the exceeding importance of avoiding all occasions of sin. If we really desire to be holy, we, we have to take heed to our ways. We have to take heed to our ways. I would hope uh, that through the teaching we've had in the book of Ephesians, especially in chapter 5 about the uh, sexual immoral, immorality and impurity, uh, that there not even be a hint of it. I would hope that that's changed some of your viewing habits on TV. It has changed some of mine. And you know what we t typically do is we say, well, it only has a few bad scenes in it. So we become the arbiter of what's right, how much is okay, a few bad scenes, or we endure something. But he said, let there not even be a hint. That's not legalism, folks. That's the word of God. God said, let there not even be a hint of it. So let me ask you this. Is obedience to God better for you, or is disobedience to God better for you? Yeah, and what happens when you're actually obedient to God? Don't you love him more and want to be more obedient? It becomes very natural, like you go, ooh, I, I don't want to do that, because I have the joy of the Lord in my heart. We tend to lower the standard. God, you know, puts it up here for us. So. Few male and female believers have not crossed this line before, from attraction to lust at some time or another. We are all adulterers by this standard. Would that be correct? Okay. That realization ought to deliver us from judgmentalism against other people. Like, let's say you've never committed adultery but you see people, you know somebody that has, good possibility, if you're not a healthy believer, you're going to look down your what at them? Hmm? You're going to condemn them, right? Well, he, he's an adulterer. Oh, any other, are there any other adulterers around here? It ought to deliver us from that. It ought to deliver, deliver us from being snobby Christians and haughty 
and have an arrogant attitude towards those who have fallen into adultery. It's a big problem in our world. I mean, as I'm speaking here to you and anybody who's watching, you know, uh, this may be very uncomfortable for you. I cannot read minds, okay? So, but I do know that all of us at least are guilty in terms of looking. So there's another truth in what Jesus is saying. Sexual sins are preceded by what? Sexual fantasies. You, you see a beautiful woman, you cross that line, you start looking at her, and maybe she's a fellow employee, or she's a school teacher, or she's your boss, or a friend of your friends, a neighbor, somebody you see regularly, and you start lusting after her, you're fantasizing in your mind what you would like to do with that woman. So sexual sins are preceded by sexual fantasies. This was precisely the case with King David. A lot of things happened with him. First of all, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He stayed at home, which was unusual for him. It was at the time when kings went to war. Uh, they, it's a little cold in here, Doug, if we could just uh, uh, help it not to be too cold. Thank you. Um, and thank you for letting me know when it's too cold. We don't want you to be uncomfortable. Um, if we wanted to drive you out of here, I guess we could just drop it down to 32. But, but uh, they, they would plan to go to war when it was a good time. They didn't want to go during the winter. They'd like to do battle during the spring. Normally, David went to war in the spring. But for some unknown reason, he stayed at home. And it was a warm kind of a spring summer night. He couldn't sleep. He got up to walk on his terrace, maybe getting some cool air to cool him down and to look at his beautiful city, the city of David. He looked around and his eye caught an unusual, beautiful woman bathing. That was just, he wasn't lusting. He just, whoa, a beautiful woman. As to how beautiful she was, the Hebrew word is very explicit. It says, the woman was beautiful in appearance, very. She was young, she was in the flower of her life, and the evening shadows made her even look more enticing. So David's look became a stare, and mentally, adultery took place. And then he wouldn't be denied even when his servants humbly reminded him that she was the wife of one of his top soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. So the fantasy preceded the act, and that's how it always begins. No sensual sin has ever been committed that was not first imagined. Scripture says it, and our experience confirms it. And our imaginations are a gift from God. They can be used to think of how do we get a man on the moon? Or they can be used to think of the most horrible things. If we abuse our imagination, its offspring is great evil. So how marvelous are the words of Jesus? How marvelous are they? In one short sentence, he elevated our entire concept of sexual purity beyond the, the, the sphere of physical to a matter of the soul and the heart. And in doing so, he has shown us our hearts and uncovered the source of all our troubles in that regard. His words cut, they are surgical, they expose us to our sin, and they show us his radical righteousness. So the question becomes, well, how can we live a life of purity in this age of sensuality? And man, is this age of sensuality worse than ever? Well, the answer to how can we do it, we have the radical demands of the new standard of purity. So in verse 29 and 30, you have the answer. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, Cast it from you, for it is more profitable 
for you that one of your members, your eyeball, should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. In other words, he's saying uh, you'd be better off to go through life with a difficulty than to be cast into hell because you've continued on in your, your, your sin. You've decided, I'm not going to do it. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should uh, perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, if we took these literally, we would have a lot of blind people walking around, wouldn't we? They'd have no append, no hands. You couldn't see they have no hands because you've got no eyes. Am I correct? <laughs> Do you know that in history there were people who took this literally and tried to pull out an eyeball? I mean, if you're going to pull out one, you still have one left. Jesus was not talking about actually cutting off your hand or cutting off your feet. This is called spiritual mortification. Mortician, right? Dead people. So he's talking about putting to death those things which cause you to sin. Spiritual mortification or mortify. The word means to crush, to humble, to abase, and to take down. A British pastor named John Stott explains it beautifully. Let me read what he said. What does this involve in practice, these plucking and so on? He says, let me elaborate and so interpret Jesus' teaching. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. In other words, if your eye causes you to sin because temptation comes through your eyes, then the objects, then the objects you see, then pluck out your eyes. That is, don't look. Don't look. Behave as if you had actually plucked out your eyes and cast them far away from you, and you are now like a blind man who cannot see those objects which previously caused you to sin. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin because temptation comes through your hands, things you do with your hands or your feet, places you visit, then cut them off. That is, don't do it. Don't touch it. Don't go there. Behave as if you actually cut off your hands and feet and had flung them far away, and now you are like a crippled man, and so you cannot do the things or visit the places which previously caused you to sin. That is the meaning of mortification. Notice this. Drastic measures are always appropriate in order to protect one's spiritual health. If we had a, what's that disease they had in Africa over the last couple of years? Ebola. If we were told that there's Ebola in Visalia, it was in a certain part of Visalia, what would you do? Would you just go, well, let's just, hey, let's take a walk down to that side of town. Would you do that? You, you take drastic measures. You, you'd say, we are not going near that. We're not going a mile near that, right? There, because that's dangerous. You'd take a drastic measure. You'd gather your family members together, right? So drastic measures are always appropriate in order to protect one's spiritual health. Halfway measures never do the job. This strikes against our desire to seek the middle of the road. We always like to say, you know, go to the middle of the road and never be too extreme either way. But it is Christ's advice. Remember, I didn't make this up. The Lord Jesus Christ said this. And some people, perhaps here tonight, some of us may need to take some extreme measures today, possibly. 
The principle of mortification has universal application to all areas of life, but here Jesus was applying it to sensuality. This all may sound, it all may seem very negative, but it leads to very good and profitable results. Jesus is telling us that there must be mortification of a person's eyes. That is, we must control our eyes. And this advice may be more needful for men rather than women because men are more visually what? Stimulated. But it still applies to women as well. In the simplest terms, this forbids the second look. A godly man or a godly woman who, a, a godly man or woman who are trying to be godly must not take that second look. When talking with the opposite sex as a man, you know, in the military, um, especially officers, high-ranking officers are trained whenever they're talking to a woman to maintain strict eye contact with them, never allowing their eyes to go even a half an inch below the eyeballs of that woman. And that's good advice for any man when you're talking to a, an attractive woman. You, you maintain eye contact with her. Your eyes may be wanting to go somewhere else, but don't let it happen. How, do, how much does a woman appreciate that, by the way? Hmm? She knows you're not a dirty old man, a leech, and a, you know, that kind of a thing. Women that are wholesome can sense that from men a lot more than men think they can. Women have got like a sixth sense for dirty old men. That is good women. That's not in my text, but I'm throwing it out there for you. Wouldn't we agree, ladies? Yes, of course. So, ladies, if you see all the men coming in here with bandaged eyes and <laughs> crippled up on Sunday, um, you'll know <laughs> there was some serious business took place between Wednesday and Sunday. The book of Job gives us some life-saving wisdom in that regard. He is a good example for us to follow. Turn with me to the book of Job chapter 31 for just a moment. Isn't this a great Bible study? Are you appreciating what Jesus is saying? You know, he's trying to equip those disciples, the disciples, and he's speaking to the average Joe on the street who they themselves thought, as long as I don't do the deed, I'm okay. And it, put yourself in their mind as they've just heard him say all this. They're thinking, holy smokes, whatever they were thinking, right? Oh my gosh, I'm guilty. Job chapter 31, verse 1. What did he say? I made a covenant, Job 31, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Now, for those of you who have daughters, how much would you appreciate what Job is saying right here? To the men that you know that know your daughter. Hmm? You'd appreciate it, wouldn't you? I tell young women, never trust a man until you really get to know him. And don't, and don't ever start letting your emotions get involved with a man until you find a, his Bible. This is one that does have gold on it, but uh, a man who's got a Bible, uh, you want to make sure there's no gold on the pages. Because if you read, this is a new Bible, by the way, if you read the Bible uh, enough, those, that gilding will, will go off of there. Some smart-alecky young men will take a toothbrush and kind of try to <laughs> say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, honey, I go to church. In reality, he only started going last week. So I tell women, young women, don't trust a man till you can, that he proves to you what his character is. Do all the men here understand why I'm saying that? Of course. We are men. 
and we were not always Christian men. Am I correct? Okay, you can speak if you want. So I made a covenant with my eyes to what? Not look with lust at a young woman. Do you think Job's friends who had daughters would have appreciated what Job just said? Sure would have. Uh, Job 31, verse 7. Look what he says in verse 7. I have strayed from his pathway. Oh, excuse me. If I have strayed from his pathway, or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or if I am guilty of any other sin, dropping down to verse 9, if my heart has been seduced by a woman, or if I have lusted for my neighbor's wife. In other words, he's saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. A wise man or a woman will make a covenant with their eyes. You know, um, I remember many years ago traveling to Southern California, and we were in the, might have been the Brea Mall area or the Fullerton Mall, some big mall down there. It was the summertime, which is always uh, very difficult for men because of the way women dress. And most men know what it is to take, to not take a, a, a second look and to not, just to not do it. And they know if they keep on that course, they're gonna do just fine. Most men also know if you, if you take that second look, your day's probably shot because you're going to keep looking. And by the way, there's thousands of beautiful young women walking by. I remember going down there thinking, oh, I remember thinking, I'm going to have to just walk through the mall like this or like this. It's, a, it's difficult. So making a covenant with our eyes, this certainly would include television, movies, internets, social media, which is like a fire hose of pornography. Even one of these uh, dating sites, you know, I don't know the name of this one, they have this one girl there, her name is Cindy, I'll call her Cindy. Um, and sometimes, they'll, she's a very attractive gal, and sometimes they'll show her and she says, well, I'm just waiting to meet somebody, you know, and they show her in different situations. But they have a soft core porno site of her, pictures of her, every 10th time they show that one. So they go from being pretty, um, modest to just full-blown that's just full-blown pornography is what it is and i go cindy's being naughty today you know they're being naughty and there are people watching this it's everywhere 33 billion hits on one website and folks what just happened last week two weeks ago in new york and in virginia about the abortion of babies, and what did we just read last Sunday in the book of Ephesians, to be careful and determine what the will of the Lord is, because the days are just fine. Is that what it said? No, because the days are what? The days are evil, and it, it, the evil is like a flood. You folks that are my age have lived long enough to remember television when it was Dobie Gillis, it was Wagon Train, it was the Ponderosa, uh, right? Father Knows Best. You wouldn't see anything near what we see today. If, if you could have been transported from back then to today and turned on, first of all, it's color HD, 90,000 inches wide, and it's full of pornography, you'd go, what in the world's going on here? Well, that's the trend, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So 
here you have Jesus talking about this, and you have Paul saying, use your life to be in God's will because the days are evil. You know, the Iranians, who do they say death to? There's two countries they say death to. Who are they? Israel and America, right? The president gave the State of the Union address last night. He brought up Iran at a point, talked about the fact that that was a bad deal. I don't know, was it $150 billion that they gave him? It was some, I mean, there, these were pallets full of American dollars. In the dark of night, and he, he mentioned Iran and how they've never had the sanctions upon them that he's put on them. Well, today the Iranians were offended at that remark. And they pointed to some effort they're having to work collaterally with other nations in the Middle East, including Israel, which is really a bunch of baloney. They want to kill the, is, the they want to wipe Israel off the what? So they say these things. Folks, this, this can drive you crazy if you're trying to, you know, keep the scoreboard straight. The days are evil. The Russians, the Chinese have said, we now have supersonic airplanes that can, de can, can deliver a nuclear, nuclear payloads, plural, and they're sight unseen. You'll never see them. And the Iranians are boasting about their new missiles that can have a nuclear warhead on it that can easily get on not only to Tel Aviv, which is in the northern part of Israel, but all the way down to Jerusalem. The days are very evil. And our nation is all up in arms about the racism of the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the attorney general they're more concerned about that racism, and racism is a problem, but they're more concerned about that than they are about that state signing a law to kill a baby who was aborted and is alive on the table. The days are evil, folks. This is not back in the 60s where, you know, what was the song? Uh, I'm going to San Francisco. Rod, could you sing that for us tonight? No. <laughs> and I'm going to put a flower in my hair. Poor San Francisco turned crazy after all those hippies got there. There's probably no area where we as Christians fail more than in what we allow to enter into our minds through media. And folks, I'm telling you, these verses and the ones in... Uh, Ephesians have really rusted in my heart, and my family has made some changes and continue to make them. There are times when we need to walk away from the screen, or there are times when we need to just change the channel or turn the whole thing off. We are easily desensitized, and those impure things that, at which we laugh do not seem as bad the next time, and the last laugh will be on us. This would apply, of course, to books, magazines, newspapers, and so on. So Jesus, and please hear me, he's not calling for a life of negation. Mortification is not only negative, but ultimately positive. It is, a, it is positive in practice because it involves cultivating good thoughts and good actions. That's what it's saying to you. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 for a moment. And you know, unfortunately, well, I'll save this thought for another day. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And now... Dear brothers and sisters, 
One final thing. Philippians 4 8. Fix your thoughts on the TV, on your iMac. Doesn't say that, does it? On the R rated movies. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Truth is measured by Christ and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. He says, fix. Fix means to actually make a connection with those things. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise as opposed to lustful thinking. A life filled with uplifting thoughts and overflowing with service to Christ will be less likely to fall into the sins of which Jesus is warning about. But more than that, we must recognize, and I hope this is comforting to you because it's comforting to me, we need the Holy Spirit to help us, don't we? What Jesus just said is true. It's not wrong what he said. He said it, it's true. But you and I, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We cannot mortify our flesh alone. Willpower will not do it. We live in an age of extreme sensuality, and here's what many people say, and I believe this, that never before in the history of the Western world, and I know Pastor Mike would agree with this, since the time of the Greek and Roman paganism has the state of marriage and sexual immorality been so low in America and across, across the world. And it's when those nations were inundated by immorality, that was the last, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Is that correct, Mike? That when they got to that point, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And even more tragic, tragic immorality has invaded the church at every level, from teenagers, and thank God for Pastor Joe, Eric Sapien, and the other youth leaders out there who are pouring their lives into those young. Would you like to be a teenager in this world today? I wouldn't. It was bad enough, you know, back in 1920 for me. <laughs> but no age group is untouched. And the havoc that it brings goes far beyond the relational horrors of divorce, illegitimacy, and abortion, and the very perversion of faith. So why is it so? Well, when a person's willful conduct contradicts their theology or belief system, either the theology must change or they must change, right? Well, we love each other, it's okay. Well, no, it's not. We have to understand that a lot of the heresy in the church today has its roots, its roots are moral rather than intellectual. There's a lot of young people, especially today, if you told them living together, well, I told you about that one young couple from a few weeks ago, still have not come back. In fact, I'll introduce them next time they come. No. <laughs> but you talk to a lot of young people today about living together, it is no big deal. Would that be true? I mean, when I was uh, in, say, uh, elementary school, late elementary school, junior high, I spent about 20 years there, they kept pushing me back. I remember you, when you heard of people living together, it was like, oh my goodness, the Hollywood stars do that. And it was unheard of. You never talked about it. Today, well, we've been living together for a long time. So we have to realize that what people do with their eyeballs, their hands, and their feet affect the destiny of their souls. And that, that's, Jesus was not talking to born-again Christians here. He was equipping the disciples but his message is, a, is as applicable, if not more today, than it was then because of technology. 
we must admit that we have adulterous hearts. We must never suffer the preacher's delusion. Do you know what that is? The preacher's delusion? The preacher's delusion is, that'll never happen to me. And then bang, there they go. We need to mortify the members of our bodies is what Jesus is saying. And we should never allow our spiritual progress dull us to the potential for sin. If you're getting closer and closer to the Lord and walking with him, um, don't think you've got it all together. Um, he that thinks he stands, what's the rest of it? Take heed lest you what? Lest you fall. So is the Lord speaking to you through this message? Is the Lord speaking to you tonight about putting something out of your life? Well, please do what he says. Don't be a hearer only, be a doer. Is God telling you to change your visual habits? Then do it for your own soul's sake and that of your family. Is God saying that a relationship should end? Then end it today. Or perhaps there is some pleasure that is okay for others, but it's causing you to stumble, and you know that has to go. So get rid of it right now. And remember, and I'd like to come in with a soft landing here as we end this message. Remember this. You cannot do it on your own willpower, can you? We can't. With our best understanding of these things, our best sincere, I don't want to do this. Lord, I want to obey you. Didn't Jesus say, apart from me, you can do what? Yeah. We need to the power of the Holy Spirit. So to obey God with humility and prayer and to ask him for strength and then to do what he says. So let's pray right now along that line, okay? Well, Father, thank you so much for the, this powerful teaching from our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, Lord, you know, are naked before you. Uh, your word sees right, you see right into our lives. You knew us before you saved us, and it's amazing that you saved us. And we desire, Lord, to, we want to enjoy a healthy life with you. And Lord, it is, it is, it is a blessing. Obedience is its own blessing. Thank you for teaching us. And Lord, help us to have compassion on an unsaved world. So many people are saying, well, I've never done that. But they're lusting all the day long. Lord, they need to be born again. Give us compassion and help us to buy up the opportunities because the days are evil. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, all righty.